I am going to hit record as well. All right, folks. How are you doing? Let me introduce to you Fred, uh, Frederick. Am I saying it correctly that way? Just simple. Yep. Frederick. It has yep. all these like Frederick apostrophes, so you know, I, I don't know if I have to like add an accent yeah. into it. <laughs> <laughs> How do I say your last name? Uh, Arsenal. Okay. So, yep. welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Are you still at um, EA Vancouver? Uh, I am currently, yes. Sweet. Yeah. That's great. So I'm real excited to kind of chat with you and, um, uh, you know, look at this work and I, I want to learn more about you and the, and the work that you've done and, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you recently do some, some work on your health and all of that stuff too? Yeah, I did actually, uh, just was trying to get back into shape and stuff, but, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a long, it's been a long haul, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it turned out pretty good. So pretty happy. That's great. You know, and I think that's one of the yeah. things that we as artists tend not to think about, you know, like for me, yeah. people that thought about their body were the jocks and the jocks were the one causing me all the damn problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was trying to balance, uh, trying to balance like my art with, uh, with just my health and uh, you know, I was, it was taking a backseat for a while. So I just thought I'd, I'd catch up on it a little bit. So going to the gym regularly now and eating properly and, uh, yeah, taking care of myself basically. So, Okay, great. I just think I turned the beeping off because the beeping I was hearing was my Discord. So tell me, um, oh. what does a day look like for you at EA Vancouver? I've been to Vancouver. Are you in the big? Mm -hmm. You're in the big office, the big building. Yeah, we're in the big, big one. Yeah, I love sure. that. It's got like that Avatar stairway, circular yeah. stairway all the way up the tree. It's it's pretty intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I used to go, it was like one of my favorite things to do is to go there and train. And this was like, you know, God, I think 15 years ago when I first started working at Pixelogic, EA was like our biggest client to go service. So I'd go there, oh, yeah. you know, every yeah, three or four months. It's a great place. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty impressive building. First day I came in, uh, kind of blew me away, but yeah, I was excited to get started. So it was, it was fun. Yeah. So, what do you do there? What does, what does a day look like? And um, really what I'm looking for here is the term character artist has a lot of variety. I, I don't mean between lead character artist and, um, and you know, senior and all that stuff. I just mean like there's a lot of different ways in which character artists interact. And so, for example, one of my students, um, Larry Kameen, he's at Sony San Diego, um, Sony PlayStation San Diego. And um, his job there has a lot more to do with using a system that they have for building the bodies and then doing final tweaks as opposed to, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's out there and they're building creatures, for example, from scratch. So what does a day look mm -hmm. like for you? Well, basically, the to begin our project, uh, it kind of started out as, uh, you know, we hired a few people to kind of get the project going. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually one of the first people hired on the project. So... Luckily, I was there from the get-go, and I kind of got to see the whole process happen. But basically, we would develop the the characters from the ground up and hopefully kind of give them a good, uh, solid starting point for pretty much every other character from that point on, just so mm -hmm. that we'd be able to reuse uh, certain bodies and assets and stuff like that. So uh, just in terms of uh, efficiency, we, we kind of started out just like that, you know, creating a good base for everything. And then uh, as the projects and tasks came along, we would, uh, you know, use the, the stuff that we've been uh, elaborating on a little bit over time and uh, just kind of developing the characters, developing the props, uh, you know, kind of iterating on what we've already decided was, you know, locked in basically. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of exploring, but uh now because we're kind of in the mid mid production it, it's we're getting you know we have a, a much nicer rhythm uh everything is kind of locked in and uh we're just iterating a bit more on um, you know exploring uh different skins and different costumes and stuff like that everybody has you know we all share the same responsibilities there's nothing you know we have specialists and stuff like that you know that there's they specialize in certain things like clothes or, or fur or anything like that. But mm -hmm. typically we, we, uh, we tend to share all the work. So uh, it's, it's, we, we have a really good team and we have a really good system in place right now. So it's, it's been great. So when you mean share, do you mean that um, one person owns a character and they get help? Or does that mean that, you know, one person is working on a character in one day and the next day another person's working on that character? Yeah, it tends to kind of jump back and forth, to be honest, depending on, you know, we, we tend to own our own assets, so uh -huh. they'll be handed out 
uh, you know, we'll be giving out our, our assets. Uh, it'll be given us given to us as a task. We'll work on it. You know, we can, depending on what they scheduled, uh, it'll usually, we'll usually bring it from beginning all the way to the end. Uh, there might be some things that need to be changed uh, in the middle. You know, you know, some some notes come up and, you know, the priorities change. So tasks change from people to people. Yeah. And then they would, you know, it'd be transferred over to someone else. So, yeah, we, we kind of like mix and match. But typically because of just in terms of consistency, we try we try to tend to uh, keep the same artist on the same asset as long as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do, we help each other. We collaborate, you know, we, we talk about what the other person, you know, basically we're trying to, make it seem as if the entire project was created by one artist. Yeah. So, you know, so that we're all on the same page in terms of art style. So right. yeah, it's just a lot of collaborating, but yeah, we, we do tend to jump back and forth between, uh, you know, having one asset go between a few people, especially if it's one of the earlier on assets. So, okay. yeah. And are you, uh, are you on a project that you can name? Uh, it's technically it's, uh, it's unreleased and unannounced, but, mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, so I, I don't think I, I'm at the liberation to say much about it, to be honest. But uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's unreleased, but it's, yeah, it's it's in mid-production, so it should be announced quite soon. Okay, got it. So when you were starting out, uh, about how long ago were you starting out before you got your job and and got like went pro, basically? Uh, you mean at EA or just in general? Just in general. Uh, well, actually, I've only been in the industry for about. 1.5 just under two years mm -hmm. so i was i was at school for about a year and a half before that yeah uh so i, I kind of i guess my career from like just in in general from the 3d industry has been i started as like a beginning of 2015 Got and then i've been working uh as a modeler ever since 2016 yeah okay great so with that um was there a specific thing that you focused on that really helped you kind of land that first job was there, you know, cause I think the software had started to shift about, about that time. Like substance mm -hmm. has been around yeah. for a while, you know, like ZBrush was around actually for, I think eight years before anybody even really took notice. It was around for eight years before Lord of the Rings. Um, oh, wow. you know, but you know, it took off after Lord of the Rings and, um, for sure. yeah. so was substance around, was it a big thing? Was there something you did that you focused on that helped you get that job? Well, uh, the software we were using in school was, uh, I would say, considering at this point, it would kind of be a, a little outdated, at least in my workflow at this point. Yeah. We were using uh, Quixel and we were using Mental Ray as renderers. Uh -huh. Nowadays, I, I don't see myself ever going back to either of those programs, not because they're bad programs or bad renders. They're just they're just not my work. Like they're not included into my workflow anymore. Yeah. So it's not something that I, I, I like uh, that I it's my usual go to. Um, it doesn't produce the quality of work that I want to produce right. and especially in the amount of time that I'm trying to produce it in. So, um, Quixel was great, but it didn't, it, it just didn't mesh with me as well. So then I, I started exploring with uh, substance painter and stuff like that. So that's kind of when I got into that and I kind of developed my, my workflow a little stronger, but, uh, in school, yeah, we were using whatever, you know, resources we were given at the time. Uh, we didn't have all of the softwares available at the time, so Substance Painter w was out and it was a thing, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't used across our school or anything. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we we generally kind of just went with the flow with, with what we had at, at at work or at school, and then kind of once we got into the industry, uh, same deal with uh, our in, our uh, employers. We would work with what what which with whichever software that they gave us basically mm -hmm. yeah so yeah when i when i moved to my first job uh, we started using arnold which was a nice little change uh, i loved arnold's it's great uh, really intuitive really great results and uh, yeah it's been it's been a nice little switch jumping back and forth between stuff trying to find a, a good flow i guess but right. yeah yeah Awesome. Um, so uh, if we're looking at your portfolio over there on Artist Awake, is there any of these that are from your demo reel and from getting that first job? Yeah, the the, the barbershop one, that's actually my very first school project. Uh, well, I mean, there's the barbershop chair, which was the initial hero object of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is my demo reel. Uh, I wanted to create something, you know, I, at the time I was told doing characters was a lot of more difficult than creating environments. It was a much more cutthroat uh, industry. Yeah. And the competition was much more, you know, intense. And I was, I was just basically not talked out of it, but I was 
just from hearing about it, I was a little unmotivated to even attempt to mm-hmm. get myself in there. Great. So yeah, I decided to do environments. I like, I loved hard surface modeling. Uh, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's been one of my favorite things to do for a long time. Uh, and then I just eventually, I guess you could say accidentally started doing characters. I, I wanted to explore. <laughs> and then uh, I tried a, a bust, you know, here and there just to stylize thing here and there. And then, yeah. Uh, I guess I got recognized for it. So yeah, it, it was a strange transition because I, I just heard so many, you know, aggressive things about the character art industry and how uh, it can be pretty cutthroat, right? So yeah, uh, and that's great because yeah. that's actually what I wanted to touch base on because I'm looking here and and at the beginning of your portfolio is a lot of uh, props and environments. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell me, I, correct me if you, if I'm wrong here, but I think that also gave you a very achievable. Um, kind of uh, project level to kind of grow your skills in materials and all that stuff. It did. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cause character uh, is so vast. It is. Yes. So it, it was a bit difficult for me to, you know, considering this was my first attempt at trying to do hyper real or, or just realism in general, mm-hmm. it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a difficult thing to figure out. And I had a lot of stuff to learn, but, for what I had at the time, it was good. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it did transfer over to characters to a degree. I, I was able to learn a lot about materials, and mm-hmm. what reacts to how, you know, how lights react to certain materials and objects and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's actually funny now looking at my portfolio, uh, I've actually deleted a lot of the hard surface stuff that I had previously, just mm-hmm. because I, now that I'm known as a character artist, I kind of wanted to showcase my portfolio as that. Uh, it's become, yeah, so like some of the older stuff, I've kind of organized it by age as well or like by most recent work. So uh, this older stuff at the bottom is some of my very early on school projects. And then you can kind of see develop over time where I just started realizing, oh, well, I need to start doing more characters. And then that was pretty much all I was doing. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, the development now, now, now that I look at it, actually. Yeah, that's great. So how was this accidental going to uh, from environment to character? You just started well, doing some, the, some stuff and how did they notice? What did they? Yeah. So when I got hired from, so I, I applied uh, to icon creative studio in Vancouver yeah. uh, using my, my barbershop demo reel. So I, I got the job right out of school, which was nice. I think they just needed someone, you know, who had a basic understanding, well, basic, a, a decent understanding of modeling and rendering and texturing and whatnot. So that got me in, which is nice. And then, you know, I was, well, during my time there, I kind of handled all types of assets. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, minimally, I did did very little characters. If anything, I only was shading or I was only texturing them for a little while. Yeah. Uh, But I was doing mostly hard surface assets, you know, texturing props here and there, environments. Basically, I was doing what my demo reel was showcasing, which was nice because it was what I was applying for. Yeah. Uh, and then during my time there, I guess I just started exploring, uh, just doing characters on my free time, just doing little sculpts here and there. Uh, I was really attracted by the stylized uh, sculpts that I like some some of the busts I was seeing. So I was, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Randy Bishop was a huge inspiration for me in terms of uh, art style. So I just started doing some of his his um, pictures but in 3d mm-hmm. and then uh, the more i did it the Who more again, uh, i enjoyed it randy bishop he's a 2d character artist or 2d illustrator i guess you could say yeah um he has a really distinct style and uh he has some amazing stuff and yeah it's it's really impressive i, I love his his work and uh it's been transitioned to 3d quite a bit just because it, it reads so well mm. um but yeah i i saw it and immediately thought to myself this would be a, a fun thing to try to do you know a bust here and there um so yeah it's been fun but uh i, I would say it kind of accidentally happened because when i started doing that uh that's when ea recognized me actually that's mm. when they they came to me they sent me an email and said hey uh, we like your style of of characters we'd like to you know send you a test and see if you'd be a right fit for our team and then uh i took the test and everything went well so that's great. So, which one of these yeah. do you think they were looking at? Was it the Karate Zombie, the um, the uh, well, Diablo? Yeah, the the Karate Zombie actually is the test I did for EA. So that one was what I gave to them to kind of show that I could work with them. Uh, I think they said that they liked the the Devil one and the the 
Randy Bishop one, which is the one right beside it. Mm-hmm. But basically, I guess they just saw that I had, um, yeah, I, I had kind of a stylized approach to most of my modeling anyways. I think they also noticed uh, the Super Monsters production that I worked on at Icon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they saw some of the hard surface stuff there, I guess. And uh, yeah, I, I guess they just, uh, they saw some of my stylized stuff and liked it. So contacted Tell me, me then and yeah. Yeah. Tell me about the art test. What do, what kind of parameters, I mean, at least anything that you can talk about, what kind of parameters did they give you? Um, and really what I'm looking for is, is like, what kind of parameters somebody should expect? Um, you say they gave you five days. Yes. Do they give you a concept or anything like that? Or did they just say, hey, come yeah. up with something? So they gave me a rough concept. Uh, they told me, you know, this is a rough idea of the character that we want you to make. Um we basically want you to emphasize on certain things like hair and folds, uh, that those things were really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, considering I, had, I hadn't done really much of it beforehand, it was kind of a nice thing to try to attempt. Yeah. I say looking back at it now, it's definitely more, um, it's a little too sharp, I would say that I went. Yeah. But basically, we're looking for simplistic, you know, uh, really cleanly executed uh, shapes and yeah, they were basically they emphasized on hair and folds and a overall appeal. So looking at the model from pretty much every angle and seeing if there's anything that sticks out as, you know, something that would be kind of that looks a little awkward or just looks not appealing, basically. So that's something I had to really keep in mind when I was doing the, the, the test. So they really emphasized that as well. Great. And was the concept an image or did they give like text to it? Yeah, they gave me an image and then they basically wrote some criteria uh, telling me what specifically they would want to see from it, yeah. uh, what they would want me to highlight. So yeah, like I said, the folds and the hair and, and uh, some of the nice shapes that they wanted to emphasize. But that was basically what they were using as criteria for all of the tests given to all of the artists. Got it. Um, yeah. And it was in pose. So they wanted you to model it. Uh, did they care if you modeled it in pose or T pose or any of that stuff? No, they didn't actually specify that. They just said, you know, we give you five days. Let's see how much. Basically, it was kind of a test as well in terms of speed and mm-hmm. efficiency. Yeah. Uh, because we're, I'd say roughly given a, a full character in five days is very short, I would say, especially in our production that we're doing right now. Yeah. We're, I'm, I'm doing, uh, you know, a skin for uh, a production or for a character. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, it, its budget is usually 10 to 11 days. So something like that is you know, it's just kind of a test and seeing how efficient you can be, but they didn't specify any poses or anything. They just said, model this character, uh, given the criteria we gave you and, uh, let's see what you can do kind of thing. So the posing and the little, you know, extra texturing, they didn't ask for any, uh, shading or anything like that or lighting. They just said, send us the ZTL. We'll take a look at it and we'll just assess your basic knowledge of what we're looking for. And, uh, yeah, that's what I sent them. And then after that, once, uh, once they confirmed I had the position, I kind of just had a little bit of fun with the model and threw it into Marmoset and took some renders and yeah, it was fun. Oh, okay, cool. So when you gave it to them, did you give it in pose or did you give it? I gave them in uh, a pose, just a A-pose. basic, uh, yeah, just a basic a pose in ZBrush. Yeah. 30 degrees, 45 degree arms. Got it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So in a pose. Great. All right. So somebody's not going to be expected to actually five days and then pose the thing and then be like, you know, on from there. No, no. Yeah. Like unless it's unless it's specified by them, it shouldn't yeah. be a requirement. So with this process, um, I want to know both the process you used in the art test. And I'm kind of focusing on the art test because it's this like unknown um, quantity, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, for the students. It's like you know they all want to, we all want to get out there and take those tests, but it's like this unknown thing. So, um, are are you uh, in this one? Did you model this in Maya in ZBrush? Um, do you start with the base mesh? And then I want to contrast that with the process that you have today. And, um, and one of the big questions I have, just to give you a sense of where I'm leading with this, is how big a part ZBrush is in your, um, in your pipeline. And, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm getting to that question is because it's such a big part of our like, emotional life. We love it. It's so mm-hmm. much fun. Um, but I often have students coming to me and ZBrush is their only exposure. So they don't even have experience with Blender even. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So, so talk to me about your process right. here and then contrast it with, you know, in production. I, 
Yeah, I would say that like for a little bit of, before I did this art test, my exploration was with ZBrush was a little bit limited, and my knowledge was also quite limited as well. But mm-hmm. I I tended to uh, lean more towards Maya. That was my preferred modeling software, and okay. had been for a long time. I very much tailored my uh, workflow to to Maya. So ZBrush was a nice little change for sure. Uh, you know, the our test was basically the beginning of when ZBrush became my primary software. Uh, you know, it was, yeah, like this, uh, this this Utopia sculpt here. This was done very early on. This was a school project, something that I had just, you know, tried to have fun with in ZBrush, not really caring about uh, too, too, anything too crazy, you know, like uh, all different types of angles and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah, the ZBrush is a nice, it's definitely, it's definitely an intimidating, intimidating software in the sense that, you know, there are so many things in the software you wouldn't really realize are in there unless you explore and try things. And uh, Maya, I would say, is not quite the same. Maya, for me, is a little bit more straightforward. You know, it's all laid out there for you. It's easily customizable. You can tailor it to whatever type of workflow works for you. Uh, So, I mean, ZBrush for students, I remember... Uh, it, it was a little bit daunting for them to try to break down and, and, and use, you know, even just the basic stuff like poly groups, you know, and stuff like that. That's something that I use now on a, on an absolute daily basis. It's, yeah. I, it's ZBrush is my most used software at this point. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to slowly integrate my Maya knowledge into ZBrush. So I'm using ZModeler a lot more. Uh, mm-hmm. That was actually something that they asked coming into the interview was, do you know Z modeler? And I said, um, not as proficiently as I do Maya, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm much faster in Maya in terms of hotkeys and stuff like that. That's really important for me. And if, and if just on a side note, if I can emphasize stuff like that, uh, for any students or anybody getting into the industry, if they want to, speed up their workflow and be as efficient as possible, which I can vouch has helped me substantially over time, mm-hmm. making hotkeys and customizing your UI to mm. c- cut out, you know, even seconds from your workflow, it will add up and it will become, you know, it will make you a better artist and it will teach you to find the most efficient route to do things in. So, you know, Maya was that for me, but then I had to transfer that over to ZBrush, which was mm-hmm. nice, but, um, Outside of Maya and ZBrush, I would say that there wasn't many other softwares that I was using for modeling. So there, there's no, you know, Blender or uh, just because I, I hadn't explored with it or even Mudbox, for example. But mm-hmm. I've, I still know people who are veterans in the industry who work with me right now and, and could say that Mudbox is better than ZBrush. I know, or, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, they, they, would, they would say that. And, you know, many people would disagree with them, but they have their reasons. So yeah. I'm not going to argue. Oh. Yeah, Jan, Jan's ready to stoke the fires over there. Is it? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I used to refer to that program as the program that shall not be named. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, so that. many people vouch for it. I mean, they, they love it. They, they haven't let it go since, you know, they, they're saying, you know, updates are coming out and it's taking them forever. But let's be honest, uh, ZBrush is kind of the same for some of the most basic stuff we've been asking for, in my opinion. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's an, it's interesting. It's interesting, too, because I was kind of privy to some of the background of the development of Mudbox and then with Pixelogic and then the sale of it and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and one of the things that I think is a real testament um, to Pixelogic is, you know, they they never uh ofer never once freaked out which i ofer never freaks out anyways he's the developer of zbrush um mm-hmm. he's like probably one of the most zen people i've ever met uh he just got to work you know and he knew right off the bat that you know if they're going to survive which it was a question of survival back then um he was just going to have to develop cooler stuff faster and he told me once he's like you know there there we can easily beat them because you know, it's one person. We're just going to iterate. They have a whole team and they, they're going to be slow. And that's what he did. Right. Yeah. So yeah. God, God bless him, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, with this done and said, uh, that kind of blows my mind that they asked if you know Z Modeler in the interview. That's great. Yeah. Be, just because in terms of cleanliness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even some of my most recent work, um, I'm actually doing an art station challenge again right now. Yeah. For, it's my fourth one. And I'm using Z Modeler 
in every piece that I've created because in terms of cleanliness, um, it, it's, it's, it's so efficient. Uh, you, you're working in ZBrush, so you're assuming you have to work with, you know, clumps of mold, you know, type, you know, digital clumps of mold, and you have to create something that's, you know, kind of in the hundreds of thousands of polys. And but the key, the key, even for, you know, really detailed assets, you know, like the night that I created, the beginning process was mostly all Z modeler. You know, work as low as you possibly can. This guy here. And then just yeah, exactly. So this was kind of like. Uh, a little bit of middle ground between adding detail and, and folds. You know, I'm only adding resolution as I need it. I mm -hmm. never needed to add more than, than what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the key at this point for me to add, uh, to, to stay clean, right? To stay clean as, as much as possible. Uh, this one, so yeah, this is kind of full blown, you know, start uh, adding subdivisions, start adding resolution to, you know, or uh, adding detail, right? The little tiny little things like scratches and, yeah. and wear and whatnot. But yeah, uh, the key in ZBrush for me is just stay as low as you possibly can until you have to. And I know that a lot of people would say, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that that's obvious, but it's amazing how people who are still working in the industry who have been working in this, working in the industry for as long as they have work super high and it, and it ends up looking really messy and clumpy and mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't look very appealing. So yeah, Z modeler at our work is it's uh, it's it's amazing. We, oh. Everybody uses it, and it's a requirement. So that's that's exciting to hear. You know, because yeah. I I also hear from the other side of it, people are like, "What the hell are they doing with this program?" Oh, because <laughs> you know we don't have the hotkeys. Like you can't use the hotkeys. Yeah, like you do in Maya. So when I was modeling yes. in Maya, you know, it was just like marking menu to marking menu to marking menu. You know, in three seconds, you have less than three seconds, you have your tool. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, you, am, yeah, go for it. Talk. To no, sorry, I was just gonna say, yeah, you you can. I, I've slowly started implementing some of my my uh, hot well, not the same hotkeys as I have in Maya, but some I would say are, mm -hmm. and I've started hotkeying, you know, uh, brushes and stuff now. So yeah. you know, because I'm realizing, you know, if I can cut one second or half a second from, you know, doing BMV every time I want the move brush or BZM every time I want the the Z modeler brush. I tend to just, you know, hotkey it to one and two, and then it's fast. I can just access it that, like, switch between the two in a matter of, you know, half a second. So stuff like that is crucial for working fast. Yeah. Have you created multiple Z modeler? And we're getting a little Z brush centric here, but um, uh, have you created multiple uh, Z modeler brushes with different presets in them? No, actually, I've just left it at default. Cool. The default settings work for me, uh, and honestly, if I have to hop onto anyone else's computer. It, 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 you know, I, it transfers over nicely, so I don't have to really worry about the stuff that I do. So great. Yeah. And am I looking at one? Um, is this a low res, as in you've retopologized, or is this straight yes. in your um, ZBrush pipeline? Yeah. So basically, I start. Uh, I try to make it as low as possible, but it's usually unless you know, it's it's kind of hard to work as low as possible and maintain the topology for your game res. Yeah. Um, it's it's it, it's. That would be maximum efficiency. If I could do that, I would, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, you know, you, you want to be able to keep it low as possible to be as fast as possible so that you can iterate on it and, you know, make quick changes and whatnot mm. and work non-destructively. But also, you can't really think about functional topology that early. You kind of just have to worry about shapes and forms and important silhouettes. Yeah. So I block out something in low, as low as I possibly can just to work with. I start dividing up, adding detail, and then I will take that into Maya. If I can reuse some of the, the, the topology that I had in, in ZBrush with some of the low rest stuff, I will. You know, I, I tended to, I did that with um, one of my old art station challenges. It's that the robot from the Wild West. Mm -hmm. I did that. I basically did it all in Maya, brought it into ZBrush, sculpted it in, in, uh, sculpted a little bit more. And then, uh, yeah, uh, it was, it was a very, very smooth process. So. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Glad we answered your question, Jan. All right, let's move on from that. What other software do you guys use? You said some people focus on say marvelous designer. I think you said, am I right? Uh, at, at my work, you mean? Yeah. Or? You said you have yeah, some so specialists on your team. Yeah, we have some specialists, but it's mostly, again, it's all specialists within ZBrush. We don't, unfortunately, we don't use any uh, Marvelous Designer or anything mm -hmm. like that. Well, I think our, 
our softwares are limited to Maya, uh, ZBrush, and uh, Substance Painter, basically. And we do some substance designer stuff, but that's more on the world team. As for character artists, we tend to not uh, typically use that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's mostly, uh, like I said, ZBrush, Maya, and Substance Painter are our main three softwares. And Marmoset, Marmoset, I can't forget Marmoset. That's a fantastic software, by the way. What do you do instead of Marmoset? What do you use that for? Uh, Marmoset, we use it for baking, mm -hmm. and that's it. <laughs> yeah, the baking so, yeah, is the unreal, bake. isn't it? I mean, they're the tools they've built yeah, for that are crazy. It's impressive. Yeah, it's it's an amazing piece of software, and uh, I can't believe I did anything before. Like I, I was using X normals, I think, before for baking, and it's just not as yeah. intuitive for me. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I get I'm huge on visual uh, feedback. So mm -hmm. if I can see my bakes being applied, and you know where I can look at all the little artifacts and stuff like that, it, it's great. I used to actually also bake all my maps in Substance Painter. Yeah. So uh, that to me was, you know, it wasn't as intuitive and I couldn't see it as well. I can, there's not as much control basically. Yeah. So now that these new bake groups, you know, that they've implemented in Marmoset, it's, it's amazing. It, I can't, uh, I can't go without it. Yeah. It's, uh, we had them yeah. into demo. Um, I think it was before they did anything like the bake groups, but we had them to demo about a year ago. I might be wrong. And um, Will, who actually the Will is their tech support. And he was, was my first employee. He was the first person I ever hired was Will. And um, so he got, I got to meet him again, which is great. And uh, get to see him demo that software and the baking tools were, you know, with the skew and all the different ways for you to change yeah. the normal, like, God, so awesome. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. There's so much control. That's the thing. It's, it's you can, you know, any type of artifacting, uh, and by artifacting, I mean, uh, you know, like little baking errors, uh, you can control all of it. And it's, there are so many settings to change everything. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, like, I stand by it 100%. Cool. All right. So we've talked a lot about ZBrush. We talked about your pipeline, your software, kind of what you do. So it's a very, um, the work that you're, you're working on, I, I'd assume is a bit on the stylized side, right? Yep. Currently, okay. yes. Okay. Um, so now in your experience, you've been in the industry about a year and a half. And one of the questions that um, artists have in the beginning is, you know, what should I focus on? And, you know, everybody gets out there and they look and they're like, hey, I want to do, I want to work at Naughty Dog. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side of it. Hey, I want to work at Blizzard, you know, and then there's a whole world of opportunities kind of in between. And this is one of the, right. One of the things that I was really excited to talk to you about because everybody goes and says Naughty Dog or Blizzard and I don't hear people often enough saying EA, which is a massive employer. I mean, huge. It is. And yeah. uh, everybody I met in that Vancouver office was happy as hell to be there. You know, it's just such a beautiful mm -hmm. campus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to me about the job opportunities that are that are out there for people. Just from, you know, your experience here, like, you know, realistic versus stylized versus, you know, where your passion is or somebody's passions might be. Yeah, so going back just quickly to the EA thing, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen comments about that as many comments about it everywhere. It, it, it is a, it has a lot to do with you know the reputation. I think mm -hmm. uh, going you know you get an offer from EA, you're immediately you know would think to yourself, oh, uh, you know they have a bad rap, especially in the in the recent past with their their game releases and, and loot boxes and whatnot. But mm -hmm. as a, as a company, I I cannot. I cannot emphasize how amazing it's been being an employee there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. You know, the process, the team, everybody we work with, it's amazing. But honestly, coming out of school, you know, everybody always wants to work for these huge, amazing companies, right? You know, that's their goal in life. And so did I, I, I got to say like one of my biggest, you know, goals in, in my career was to try to, to get into Bioware. That was mm -hmm. one of my favorite things or one of my favorite um uh, teams to, or, uh, you know, productions yeah. or, you know, I would love to go there, but, um, at the same time, you know, I, I aimed high, but th the thing is that coming out of school, it's, it's very, very hard to get noticed by those giant companies, N mm. not because of talent or anything like that. It's just because they, in my opinion, I get asked this question a lot, a lot, a lot, quite. And I always typically say the same thing because I've attempted to do the same things, but it it just has to do with, you know, the level of quality that they have to maintain. It's nothing personal. It has nothing to do with, you know, who they think you are and whatnot. So people getting in and applying to, you know, Naughty Dog right out of school, uh, it's, it's an extremely 
ambitious goal and it, I, com- I commend it, but at the same time, uh, you know, Naughty Dog is that it, it's not Naughty Dog for being, you know, for using juniors out of school, unfortunately, right? I, I realized that coming out of school that I needed to kind of like just get my foot in the industry. That That's something that was really important. You know, that's something that was really emphasized to us was just get your foot in, 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 in the door in the industry, you know, produce some good work, move your way up, and then you'll eventually get to somewhere you never expected, right? So for me, I got I got my foot into the door at, at Icon. It was great. My time there was fantastic. And then I got recruited by EA. So, right, it was unexpected. So for me, was it was a nice, it was a great little, you know, unexpected change. So who knows, right? Coming out of school, you might not get the dream job you were expecting, but you know, give it a couple of years, you, you work your, your butt off and then it'll pay out. It'll definitely just, everything will pay off. And then, you know, it, it, you showcase your work, you showcase that you're an, a, a good worker, you listen to feedback, you're humble. And uh, honestly, everything will, will fall into place, I think. Just produce and produce and produce and keep working and keep working. And uh, yeah, it, it'll all fall into place. Mm, that's great. That's great. That's almost like the perfect ending to a podcast and to an interview <laughs> is those words of wisdom, you know? Um, and, and I think it's, it's great because you actually started as an environment as a prop guy, right? Or am I, I wrong? did. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, uh, got yeah, your, started, yeah. you just moved right up from there. I did. Yeah. And like I said, and it was kind of accidental, right? You, you start doing stuff on your, on your free time, uh, if you want to tailor your work at home mm-hmm. to some specific company that you want to go for, you know, yeah. do it, you know, they'll appreciate it, which is exactly what I did with this night. Actually. Uh, my goal was still to go to Bioware. Right. So with mm-hmm. the night that I created, I, it was my way of saying, Hey, look at me, look what I can do. This might, you might, you guys might like this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some, you know, you can tailor your work to the companies you want to work for it, they'll love seeing it, right? They'll love seeing the dedication to the, the company. Mm-hmm. So that's always a great thing to do. But yeah, I mean, don't, uh, don't be afraid to flex your, you know, your abilities and your modeling and texturing muscles a little bit, right? Just kind of explore your, your options, see what you like, stylized, realistic, whatnot, you know, shading or uh, grooming or whatnot. So don't, mm-hmm. don't really limit yourself. And then honestly, the companies will just come to you, right? If you, if you produce good work, they'll just come to you. So. Yep, that's awesome. And yeah. you're just posting on ArtStation and they contacted you, yeah? I did, yeah. I just posted my work and they found me. So maybe it was a stroke of luck, but I'm very very grateful for it. So how is your life different um, you know, now versus when you were looking for a job? You know, because you were in school and then now you're, you, you've got your job. Like, um, you know, what's changed? I know it's been some time, but, you know, I'm really just looking to kind of mm-hmm. connect with the students and where they are now and, and what's going to be mm-hmm. possible in a couple of years. Like, you know, uh, my, my friend Larry, you know, once he got that job, he's like, oh, I have my own apartment. <laughs> I'm not at my parents yeah. anymore. So that's one thing that's different. Yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, what's the most different for me was moving hometowns, uh, just kind of just changing locations. That's kind of the thing that is going to be unavoidable, I think, in, in this industry is having to jump around from job to job, which uh, might cause you to go from country to country. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of unavoidable. Um, for me, for example, I've been offered a few jobs out of pro- or out of you know the. Uh, out of country, you know, some, some in China, some in, in Sweden. So I said, I am, I, unfortunately I had to say no, just because it's, it's too much of a change for me and I have family and I have to think about that stuff. Right. But yeah. in terms of regular life, honestly, nothing drastic has changed. I would say it's, it's, it's nice to be able to mesh this kind of casually into your, into your normal life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, in coming out of school, you know, I, st- I still rent an apartment. Uh, you know, I still take the same, I still take the bus to work. Uh, you know, regular life still stays the same. It's just, you know, you get to do what you love and there's honestly nothing I would change about that. So if you're looking for the nice luxurious lifestyle, then I'm not sure what to tell you, but maybe it'll come over time. But if I get paid to do what I love, then I honestly can't ask for more. So Mm, life has been great. Cool. All right. Now, if you don't mind, I'd love to chat about the health, about your health, uh, self-care, yeah. as Corinne said. Um, and then, uh, so what What did you achieve? What actually happened, just so we have a sense of context? Yeah. Well, I was 
not taking care of myself. Uh, I guess it was, you know, my girlfriend and I kind of went through the same thing. We mm -hmm. were in school, you know, deadlines, 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 demo reels were huge, you know, we, crunching, you know, we were at school five days a week, you know, from morning till night, we had no time for ourselves. So our health kind of took a back seat. And, you know, it, it's extremely hard to balance life and health when you're at school. Mm -hmm. So I don't blame people for taking the, you know, school route for a little for the beginning. So but uh, yeah, I got to a point where I had some free time. I was working at, you know, I'm working a nine to five job now, you know, it, quote, quote unquote, nine to five. And uh, it's, you know, it, it, I, I figured out a, a nice way to integrate, you know, work with, with my health and then kind of do, you know, even have time for side projects at home. So it's just a matter of balance. You really have to just dedicate yourself to a, a schedule, make sure that it works for you. Um, like I said, like I was able to do work, uh, an art station challenge and go to the gym two days, two days, uh, sorry, I was going to the gym twice a day for five days a week. And I did this for about five to six months just to really accelerate the process. And I was able to do an art station challenge and I was able to go to work at the same time. So it's really manageable if you just spend the time to break it down and, and just, you know, work at it. It doesn't come easily, that's for sure. But it, it just you have to set a schedule and stick to it and you can't be lazy. <laughs> can't emphasize that more. You, you have to work at it. So it's, 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 it was one of the hardest things I had to do, but it, it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. So how much, I, it was, how much did you lose or gain? Uh, I've, so I got to a point where my goal was to lose fat for as much as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. I was at around 220 pounds. I yeah. dropped to about 184 or 185. 35. Yeah, yeah. Rough, yeah, yeah, roughly there. Yeah. So my girlfriend dropped even more. She she did a um a fitness competition. She she dropped 70 pounds. Oh and, uh, my god, that is hard. Yeah, it's it's amazing how much you can accomplish once you have less stress on your shoulders, right? Like uh -huh. getting in the industry was it's stressful at first, but it's you get into the groove and then you start implementing, you know, daily life again. Uh, so going to the gym was, was fun and, uh, you know, eating right. That's a huge thing. It's not just going to the gym, but you have to find mm -hmm. a proper eating schedule. Right. Yeah. Um, I contacted a personal trainer just so, or like a, sorry, a nutritionist. So she could, you know, I was crappy at trying to figure out what I had to eat mm -hmm. for me, whatever tasted good is whatever I wanted to eat. So yeah, just a little bit of help on the side. There's no shame in that. So I, uh, yeah, I just got as much help as I could and then lost uh, 35 ish pounds. And yeah, my, I, I think I posted some progress on my, uh, my Instagram here yep. and there. So yeah, so it was, uh, it was a nice little change. That's great. And it was a loss of fat and probably you building up muscle too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. So I've started to go back up in weight, but it yep. has, I've, I've cut, I've cut down the, the, the fat and I'm now upping the muscle. So, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of build, I guess at this point I'm I'm a bit more uh, lean, so that that's been that's been a nice change. Uh, I've never really been in this state before, so confidence, you know, that's <laughs> doesn't you know, really that's, come that easily. That's exactly what I was going to bring up next. I had the opposite um, issue as you. Like I I'm skinny to the point of like I'll get skeletal because I'll just I just won't eat. Oh yeah. And, you know, I tell my brother this because my brother, um, he had to go through a similar thing and, and lose a lot of weight. And he'd be like, oh, I wish I was you. And I'm like, you don't, you know, no, it's like, it's the same damn mm -hmm. thing, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it comes down to, you know, you feel different when you feel more confident in your body. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm like the skinny guy around all these like big dudes, you know, and I'm in Laguna Beach and these are all like alpha finance and realtors and all this crap. And I got to deal with them at dad day events and, you know their arms are the size of my thighs, you know, <laughs> and then I did the <laughs> yeah. inverse, right? I, uh, I went and I got a trainer and I worked out and I gained about 20, I think it was about 20 pounds of, well, you know, there was some fat and some muscle in that, um, you know, and then the, the effect that that had on my psychology and the way I walked was pretty dramatic. Was it a similar oh, thing yeah, for yeah. you? Yes, you feel different. You you feel much more confident. You're you're motivated. You when you're when you're living in a state where you're unhappy with your health and your life and the way you look, I won't less your life, but more the way you look and stuff like that. You start feeling like really down and really crappy, and your motivation just goes out the door, right? Mm. Uh, the moment you start seeing progress and you know you're, you're you're getting compliments and people are telling you how good you look, you can't help but feel 
you know, motivated to do other stuff, you know, like it, it, it does transition as corny as this might sound, it transitions over, over a lot of different things, you know, your confidence will make you feel good about yourself, which will make you more uh, motivated to work. And then, you know, and then your, your work shows, uh, you're, you're dedicated to you know improving and it, it's just a it's kind of like a, a nice little vicious cycle of, of improvement and it, it really they feed off of each other and it's great has it affected your your artwork i think it has i would say so uh I, you know because i feel like i said because i feel better about the way i i look and, and how i feel uh i'm i have a bit more energy i can stay up later and work if i need to but you know i'm not going too crazy but yeah, it, it helps you, you know, mentally, mentally, it's, it, it ups your game a lot. And uh, you feel good, you know, you go to work, you're happy, you leave work, you're happy. And, you know, not saying before you weren't, but you might be a little bit more than you were, mm -hmm. whether what, whatever your goals might be, right. So yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a, a plus for sure. Awesome. All right, Frederick, man, thank you so much. You already kind of gave the last minute advice, you know, earlier in the session, which is <laughs> to just keep <laughs> going. Um, but keep going, uh, yeah. yeah, any thoughts on artists that are here, they're in school, they're struggling with their work, their art, they're struggling with their body, they're struggling with, you know, I mean, all the things, because it's like, we're not just artists, we're, we're people, we're humans. Mm -hmm. so. We're people, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, any recommendations uh, to help them on their journey to getting a, that job? Yeah, uh, work hard and just don't give up on it, to be honest. Uh, a lot of people tend to want to just give up on it just because it's difficult, but nothing worth getting is, is should be easy to get, I, I honestly, I think. So uh, work at it, keep working. I remember when I was in school, I all I wanted to do was just take a break, relax, and get, you know slow down, but you need to just keep working at it and uh, yeah, I mean, I was raised in a family where that was some of the biggest things we needed to to learn was you will, you work your butt off, you will get rewarded for it. So just just uh, study, keep practicing, don't get unmotivated, and just yeah, just keep your head up. Awesome, and this is a perfect yeah. conversation to me have a, to have after that pulled pork sandwich with <laughs> with the cheese on top and, and my wife made that right before this so i'm so glad because i'm gonna i got eight minutes to go pick up the weights <laughs> that's right that's right yeah you know i i uh, now that you got, have a little bit more freedom with your workout you can indulge a little bit more right so <laughs> yes. it's, it's all it's all about balance right so uh man i could talk yeah. to you forever thank you so much for this call yeah thanks for having me man i appreciate it i hope uh hope i could help out a little bit all right. Take care, guys. Frederick, thanks so much. Have an amazing weekend if I don't see you before that. Frederick, thanks, man. Have fun. No problem. Enjoy. Bye-bye.